I'm so bored. Me too. I don't know why you kids are bored. Read, draw, listen to music. You'll have more entertainment back there than anything. Ugh. Mom, how did you survive road trips when you were a kid? Kate, they didn't have cars back then. Nebraska! We already got in Nebraska. No, we didn't. Did too. It was back there. Was not. Was too. Mom! Um, your mom's asleep. No, she's not. Her eyes are clearly open. World's biggest cheese! Dad, pull over! We are not stopping for the world's biggest cheese. We've got to see the world's biggest cheese. Uh, no we don't. What kind of cheese do you think it is? Uh, does it matter? Probably cheddar or Swiss or provolone or American. Or like pizza cheese or spaghetti cheese or like a really big cheese stick. We are not stopping for the world's biggest cheese. Dad, a toy store! A toy store for adults! Let's go! Um, let's, uh, let's, let's just talk about some more cheese. Well, good morning. I've, uh, heard that you've, we got some rain you know, an hour from here, but it doesn't sound like as much as you guys got, so hope everyone is all right this morning and have non-flooded basements and all that lovely stuff but uh, it's good to be with you one more time this is my last time uh, and I'm excited for your journey and the road trip you guys are on as a church and as a church family and I'll just let you know that I used to do this a lot I used to speak a lot and I used to travel a lot and when I morphed into teaching college I I still do some of that, but not as much. And when Tammy contacted me back in the spring about the summer, I said, you know, my summer load is light. I only teach one or two grad classes in the summer. So I got a lot of downtime. So I said, yeah, I'd love to. So as many weeks as you, you can. And, and I said, I'll do it on the back end and hopefully you'll have a pastor coming or no coming. So I just gave her some dates and we just kind of worked from there. And I'll just let you know that with that, it's been it's been nice to just come down and hang out with you guys and get to know some of you and hear your stories and and I just wish you the best. I'm praying for you and excited for that and just let you know that for me it's been a nice little change of pace as well for the summer to to be with you. So thank you. And today we're going to end at least my part of the road trip story with someone who whose beginning story is very much like my story but i don't really like i talked about peter last week and if you were here and him, he and i man i felt like we could just be brothers you know paul saul who becomes paul who's our journey uh, road trip person today his for his begin his story is very similar to my very beginning but after that uh, i don't really see myself like him because he seems way smarter than me and got a lot of fancy stuff and all that. And, and so as I was thinking about this last time with you this week, I thought about the idea of just sharing two stories, uh, Saul to Paul and my story, and seeing, you know, for you, where you uh, ultimately, on your road trip, where you're headed and stuff. So as I share the story, it's going to be a lot of scripture up here. Okay, we're going to go through the story. And I told uh, them back there in, this morning, I'm a visual learner. All right? I don't know what type of learner you are. There's the audio, visual, and the hands-on. I, I have to see stuff. If, you, if you're just talking to me all the time, I'll, you know, I'll start wandering off and daydream. So if you're like that today, I understand you're not going to offend me. Uh, and then there's some hands-on people who have to be tinkering and stuff. So if you're here, you're in trouble big time because... <laughs> You might as well just get up and start eating donuts or something uh, to get your uh, you know, stuff going. But, but for me, I'm visual. So as soon as I see something, it keeps me connected a lot more. So that's why you're going to see like just paragraphs and paragraphs of Scripture, uh, and you can follow along in that. But we're going to start with the Acts chapter 9. And just to give you a little brief intro into this, Saul... It, it, is not yet Paul, and he is mentioned just briefly right now. But what's going on is that he had uh, basically gotten to witness these new believers, these Christians, these disciples, sharing their story. 
And he had actually got to see where Peter had gone in front of the, the Pharisees and Sadducees, which Paul, Saul, who's Paul? If I say either one, it's the same person. He is a Pharisee, and we're going to talk about that. But he's part of the Sanhedrin, which is kind of like Congress for us. They had the Sadducees and the Pharisees, you know, the representatives and senators. And so he's part of that, and he sees Peter's testimony, and then he sees him getting flogged and taken and beaten. And, and he watches all that, and he, from that moment on, he really decides, I'm going to go after these guys because they're messing up our, our faith and our religion. These new believers, these new Christians, these followers of Jesus, they're, they're screwing with our history and our faith and our religion. And I'm going after them, and I'm going to persecute them and try to put them to death. And so that's where we're at here. Saul is on his way to Damascus to basically persecute Christians. So, Acts chapter 9 starts with, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogue in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground. And I and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up, go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. Now the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered. I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Just just quick thing here. This would be like someone telling you, Hey, go over to Osama bin Laden's house because... Uh, He's a Christian now, and he wants you to come over and talk to him, all right? So just to kind of understand the, the, the gravity of this, God's saying to Ananias, hey, go over to Osama's house, hang out with him for a while. He needs your help, okay? Maybe that might help the gravity of this. So Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, this is, this is the story of Saul becoming Paul, and this m miraculous encounter of Jesus, one of the last people to actually see Jesus face to face. They say this was actually Jesus in the flesh. But I want to share with you a little bit more about where Saul, who was becoming Paul, is and what he what his makeup is. So we're going to talk a little bit about Pharisees, all right? Who they are, and so the definition of Pharisee or or what you would hear this word is basically it's someone who's separate. They've come out and separated themselves. They believe themselves as pure, as righteous, as as just the the it people, right? They are the leaders that say, you know what? We are going to lead the Jewish people. We are the ones who are right. Everybody else are wrong. You follow us and do what we want, or do what we say. So, some, a little few things about the Pharisees. One, they believe absolutely that the Jewish people are it. Okay, so anyone, a Gentile, if you've heard that word before, if you're not a Jew in here, if you're not from a Jewish household or family, you are a Gentile. All right. So, anytime you read that, hear that word in the Bible or somewhere else, anyone who's not a Jew is a Gentile. And for the Pharisees, Gentiles were just the scum of the earth. You know, they were just, uh, you know, we absolutely no way is is 
God, the Messiah, who's coming one day for them. It's only a Jewish faith. So the Pharisees believed they were the best. And on top of that, the Jews who were rich or powerful or had some kind of success or some kind of clout, they were the, the cream of the crop. And the Pharisees believed that if you had money, then you were better than the poor. So if you were Jewish but poor, you still were kind of outside. All right? So the Pharisees had this mindset going into this, and that's what Paul learned. And he also learned that the Pharisees said, all the religious stuff that you do in the temple, you know, from eating certain animals to washing certain body parts to not doing this, not doing this, all these rules and regulations of the law. The law was given to help people, kind of like our laws today, to follow the rule, to follow the guidelines, to not stray, to commit crimes. So the law was given in the Jewish Old Testament to help people stay within the boundaries. But it was never meant to become this legalistic, rule-by-rule-by-rule document. But the Pharisees took it like that and said, that's the only way to live. And so they started pushing out compassion and love and kindness and forgiveness and all that and really adopted this do this, do this, do this, do this, do this, and you're good. So that's where we're at with the Pharisees, all right? Now, Jesus comes along saying he's a teacher, and he's teaching all this stuff, and he's using the same scriptures that the Pharisees teach about boom, 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 boom. But Jesus is going, no, that doesn't say that. It says this. No, it doesn't mean exactly that. It means this. And the Pharisees hated Jesus, all right? That's not even a close enough word. They absolutely tried to kill him or find ways to kill him at every point. You remember the story about the, the Jesus uh, and the woman caught in adultery? I don't know how many of you remember that story, but it's in John chapter 8 where Jesus basically is uh, sitting there with a group of people. And what's going on? Let me give you a little backstory here. There's what's called the Feast of the Tabernacles going on. And the Jews like to have their festivals, all right? I don't know, around Maysville, Mason County, if you got a lot of church festivals in the summer, you know, all those nice things with the funnel cakes, and, you know, you, you spend $10 to win an animal this big and ride the rides. By the way, my family and I, we do not get on fair rides, and there's a big reason. If you can pick up a roller coaster and put it in a truck and drive it and then put it back down, Absolutely not. We'll go to Kings Island, you know, you know, wherever in Louisville or Cedar Point or whatever, because those are stationary. Those things don't move. They, they like, like, screw them in for years and have maintenance people. But these fairs, I mean, they pick this thing up every weekend and move it. So for those of you who like to ride fair rides, I'm just warning you, these things are mobile, all right? And they're death traps. And so I'm just warning you, if anyone ever gets hurt by them, you heard it here first because they pick those paper babies up and move them around. But anyways, you go to these fairs, right? Well, the Jewish people are the ones who started these festivals, these fairs. I mean, they had like seven or eight of them. And they had a bunch in the spring, and then they had a bunch towards the end of the summer in the fall. And this, this one right here is the last one. It's called the Feast of the Tabernacles. And so they par- they're partying up because this is the end of the year. It's kind of like the end of the year bash for schools or going back to school kind of thing. They're done with all the work, the the crops and stuff. And so what they would do is they'd set up all these tents, basically, outside of the city. It'd be a big, big, like, state park, basically, and all these people living in tents. And they drank a lot, all right, because it was a party. It's kind of like the Lollapalooza of Jewish, all right? They're just, they're, they're basically like the Feast of Tabapalooza, or whatever you want to call it, okay? And so they're all hanging out, and they're drinking, and they're partying and stuff. And when that happens, Some other things are going to happen. And apparently, a guy and a girl got together and weren't supposed to be together because they were married, or at least one of them was married. And so the Pharisees, like, ha ha, we caught this woman tonight, Feast of Tabernacles. She, according to our law, should be stoned to death. But Jesus always talks about this compassion and forgiveness. So let's trap him. Let's, let's, Let's get him this time because. We're, we want so bad to get this guy, and we haven't been able to get him yet. We've got him perfectly trapped. If he says he's going to kill her, then he's one of us. If he says he's going to forgive us, forgive her, then we can go, ha, ah, that's against the law. You can't do this. We can arrest you. So they trounce this lady in, bring her in. And Jesus starts bending down, and he's writing. And this is the cool part. A lot of us have heard the story about, you know, the words that Jesus says. After they present their case, you know, Jesus says to them, you know, with any of you who are with, 
without sin cast the first stone. And you hear that, you know, everybody starts walking away because of that. That is a good part of the story here. But let me give you a little bit to understand why the Pharisees walked away. Because Jesus spins down on the earth, and all during this Feast of Tabernacles, the Pharisees are teaching the people. They're at the temple and the synagogue and teaching. And they're teaching from the Old Testament all these laws. And one of the main lessons that they teach is this scripture from Jeremiah 17. And it says this, O Jehovah, the hope of Israel, so the Messiah, the, the guy who's coming, who they didn't believe Jesus was, but who Jesus was. It says, O Jehovah, the hope of Israel, all that forsake thee shall be put to shame. They that depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken Jehovah, the fountain of living waters. They that depart from me shall be written in the earth. So this story about woman caught in adultery, you know what Jesus does? He gets down on the ground. He starts writing on the earth. He's writing in the dark, if you ever read the scripture. He's writing all that. And I can imagine he's writing things about them or their names and stuff. And he's writing in the dirt. And all of a sudden they know, oh, no. He's throwing this scripture that we're teaching all these people about. And he basically tells them, I've got you. You don't have me. You're not trapping me here. I've got you. And I'm using the exact thing that you just taught this week. And it says, I'm writing you in the earth, those who forsake me, because they don't understand my message. And so that's why the Pharisees get up and walk away. Not because they were without sin, because they believed that they were perfect or almost sinless. It was because Jesus was taking those words from the Old Testament and putting them right back in their face, writing on the earth. So that's the reason why he bends down and writing on the earth, if you ever read that story. And so it's incredible because all of a sudden everyone separates. But the Pharisees are livid at this. They're like, he made us look bad again. We had him tricked. We thought we had him dead to rights. He made us absolutely look like fools. We are going to get this guy. And Paul's, Saul, Paul's mentor, teacher, most people think Gamaliel was there. And so he was one of those people that were embarrassed. You see, Saul's, Paul's journey becomes one of redemption coming out of this. And I guess I want to share with you my backstory because it's very pharisaical at the beginning of my life. And there was things that separated me from God, and there was things that separated Saul from God. But he thought he was doing what was right. He was really following the letter of the law and absolutely thought, I'm doing what God wants me to do. He wasn't doing it out of evil heart or even intentions, evil intentions. He really thought he was ridding the earth of all bad by getting rid of these Christians. Now, I grew up in uh, Erlanger, Kentucky. Anyone know where Erlanger is? I see about a few of you. Not far from here, about an hour, all right? Now, unlike Mason County or Maysville or Gust area or all around here, I think, other than like this, Kenton County, where I grew up in, and Campbell County, which were along the rivers, had Kenton County schools, Campbell County schools, they had this county school district. But then they also had this thing that was called an independent school district. Now, I don't know if you know what that is, but it's a public school, not a private, public. But little towns could opt out or not be a part. I don't know how they did it, but they, they, didn't, they didn't have to be a part of the school district of the county school. So they had their own public schools inside the county, but they weren't county schools. That was my school district. But unlike the other, there was a few other independent schools. And, you know, if you've heard of Highlands, you know, Northern Kentucky, if you live in, around there or whatever, Highlands is like, woo, you know, top 10 in the state, and football team always wins the, you know, or always in the playoffs and wins the championship a lot. And then they were an independent school district. And then Beachwood schools, if you heard of them, same thing. They're like top 10 in the state and in education and, you know, scores and always winning football titles or in the playoffs. So you had them. And, and then you had the school districts that were on the river, uh, Covington, where I live, independent schools, and Newport Independent Schools, and Bellevue, and all these different independent ones inside the counties. And then you had us. I don't know what we were exactly. I feel like all the teachers, I mean, I had some good teachers, but I felt like all of them a lot of times were uh, transplanted out to Erlanger because we were on the very urge of Kenton County, 
and we were an independent school, but we didn't have the river. We didn't have like the downtown you know, area. And then we didn't have the elite schools with the top 10 education, grades, scores, nor did we have powerhouse sports teams. We, were, we just kind of were there. Uh, and I didn't know this growing up, but, you know, I figured it out the way, but we kind of had it, like, it kind of galvanized us. So anyone from Erlinger and Ellesmere, we just all hung together. And we, you know, it was just one of those, you're part of the family. I still meet people Erlinger, yeah, go. And our school mascot was the juggernauts. All right. So that kind of gives you a little bit of explanation of, of who we were. All right. Uh, by the way, a juggernaut is a, here's what it is. Now, they made those. They made it into look like it was a Trojan, you know, from the old Trojan Wars. But no, really. This, this is how, it's a cool name, I think. Well, first of all, Jug, it shortened it to Jug. So that changed the whole, you know, whole <laughs> dynamic of the, the name. But, uh, but literally, this is what a juggernaut is. The definition is a rolling massive force that destroys everything in its path. That's the definition, okay? So it sounds pretty cool. But you know what it was? It was a big ball that they'd put on the top of a hill, and when the armies would come up, they'd roll this ball down the hill, and it'd roll it over. So that's what we were, a big ball, a steel ball, basically was our mascot, all right? So that tells you a little bit about, you know, where I grew up. Very close. Smaller, independent school. And growing up there, my family was very, very much into uh, church and all the things that you do at church, all the ways that you have to look and behave and act. And, uh, you know, and they had good intentions and good hearts. But this is what they, they passed down to me. And so I started doing that. And you know what? From age zero to 14 or 15, you would have loved having me as a kid. All right, I'll, I'll just tell you. I mean, because I felt like I had to be like, the best at everything. But I couldn't do. I shouldn't do anything bad. Uh, I had to do everything at the church and everything at school. Be in the best classes and never talk back and you know all this kind of stuff. You know, people would tell me how wonderful I was all the time. Didn't tell me that after that. But uh, but those early years, they were like, "Oh, you're such a nice boy," you know, and then pat me on the head. And sometimes they thought I was a girl because I had long hair. But anyways, um, so I got into high school and I I did everything right. You know, I was. After, like, my sophomore year in high school, I think I was second or third in my class, you know, had all A's and maybe one, one that weird B in Spanish or something like that. But I'd done everything right. But I, I, was, I started looking around. And, and one thing, my, my parents did the best they could. They really did. Didn't have a lot of money. We were lower. Every, most people in early Ellesmere were lower middle class. We are just above that poverty line. So we could see the, you know, that, but we were just a little bit over it. And they tried their best, but they were very legalistic in their ways of raising me. And it was always, you know, anytime I would do something wrong, you know, my wrongs were accidentally you know, breaking something in the kitchen or uh, you know, getting a C on a test or something like that. So, I mean, that was like my, I was a rebel, you know, that, that, that. So, as I got into high school, I started looking around, and I, I was really thought that I was doing what God wanted me to do and being this Pharisee, basically, because I was looking around saying, all oh, these other people are wrong, I'm right. But I saw all these friends of mine who were like, oh, you, you, know, you can't do that, and you can't go do that, you can't go do that, and, you're, and I wasn't invited to any of the parties or any of that stuff for a while. And I thought, man, that looks, a, that looks fun. And I, I seem like I can't ever do enough and be enough. Like Whatever I do, there's another step up. And then when I try to get that step, there's another step up. And so I slowly started to stop being the, quote, perfect kid. Tried to be the perfect kid. And it started out innocently enough. You know, I'd say some lies, steal some gum and candy bars and stuff like that from stores. Started progressing, you know. I started stealing a lot, actually, and uh, was getting away with it. And I realized, you know, this this it was it was kind of just to get me a high. You know, I, my parents wouldn't let me go out and still go to parties and stuff like that. So I was I was doing what I could to kind of rebel. And then I started just making up 
lies and stuff to go to parties and, and to be able to drink and, and do all this stuff. Now it's about 15 at this point. And they could see. They started seeing, you know, I was I was I was a different kid. And so and this this was kind of snowballing. It wasn't like a instant. And so by the time I got to my junior year, it was I was on, you know, as far as this, like, this is great. Wah! You know, I never done anything like this. So I'm off here trying to do whatever I can. And my parents are just coming down. The only way they know how is to come down on me. Like, you know, this is what they've done all my life. So they keep doing it. The more they do that, the more I go and go and go. So finally, my senior year, I call them up one night and I say, uh, I'm not coming home this weekend. I'm going to go camping with my friends. And they say, oh, no, you're not. You know, you come home. And I'm, I'm like, you know, it's back when you had the actual phone with the cord to it and stuff like that. I'm on the phone, and I'm like, going like I go, guys, I can't go, man. My parents are really serious. They know. They know what I'm going to be drinking and, you know, doing drugs and all this kind of stuff at this camp. They know. And they're like, are you a man or a mouse? You know, 16, 17 years old, whatever. I'm like, I'm a man, you know, 128 pounds of me. I'm a man. And they're like, well, then don't let your parents tell you what you do. You're a man. And I was like, all right. So I flip the phone back over, and I go, look, Dad, I'm not coming home. I'm a man. And he says, son, you either come home or you don't come home at all. And I said, uh, whatever. You know, I'm 17. I know everything. Uh, I'll go do what I want. But I knew they were mad. Like, this was, I had escalated it. You know, this wasn't just a one-time thing. This had been escalated. So I hung up the phone. I go camping. And I said, you know what? I'm going to come home on Sunday morning while they're at church. That way I can, you know, get my way in the house smooth some things over, maybe get a little bit of clothes if I need to stay with a friend or two for a night. I didn't realize the level of how mad they were. I got home, my car was in, in the in the parked in front of the house because I'd ridden with some friends. They had taken all my clothes and possessions and put them in my car, changed the locks of the house, and had left a note. I still had this letter from my dad. He, my dad well, had told you before it passed away years ago but I still have this letter somewhere in my box but it it, my dad writes this letter and it's on the front door nailed to the door basically and he says you're out of here we love you we don't understand you but we can't do this anymore and so I'm I'm a senior in high school working at Kmart and I'm like oh 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 I'm on my own yes at first I thought yes I can do be free but I realized when I get in the car and I'm <laughs> push some clothes out of the way so I can drive, I was like, uh, I don't have anywhere to live. So I start calling around and uh, find a guy who graduated you know, a couple years before me and said, yeah, I got room for you. You know, hop in to my place. And so I started living there. And for the next three to four years, I just started bouncing around place to place. But in that process, I had gotten a scholarship and I was supposed to go to UK. But because of all the stuff going on, I was like, okay, I'm not going there. I'll just take some classes at NKU. And I started taking classes, but I I was failing. I I failed my first semester. They put me on academic probation. And at the time, I was bouncing around from place to place. I lived with about 15 different people in like a two or three year different span. Guys, girls, kids, all this kind of stuff. And I ended up in this place, the last place I, I lived which was really, really bad. And I won't go into a lot of details, but it was really, really bad. And in this place, the, the people that were living there were, were very much into partying, very much into drugs, very much into just going out every moment you can. And I was still trying to go to college. I was flunking out bad. You know, I'd been there for two years now, and they basically said, you're not coming back anymore after this semester. So I was trying to to maybe do a little bit to get better, but I was in and out. And one night I remember some really bad, really bad stuff happened. And I, I ended up running out of this trailer that we were living in and a bunch of us living in there, a bunch of people living in a little small trailer. My clothes were in the cabinet. <laughs> this is how small it was. Like instead of coming out with bowls and glasses, you come out with my clothes and shoes in the, in the kitchen. And I ran out in the middle of the winter night and I jumped in my car. And I, I just remember... I, I wasn't really crying. I was just, just like, where am I? I do not understand. What have I, what have I done? How did I get here? But all I knew was this Pharisee life on the other side. And I was like, I can't go back to that. That, that brought me nothing. But the way I'm headed now, 
I'm I'm a rock bottom. I, I I'm I'm doomed because I I'm done with I'm gonna flunk out of school. I know college for me is is the gateway to you know doing well later in life, and and I'm blowing it, and I don't want to live in a place like this the rest of my life, and and so I was I was just there. I just didn't know what to do. And at the same time as this was all happening, and, and I and I love God's grace sometimes because it, it really does come when you need it. One of my friends who I'd grown up with had bought a house, and he had a couple of college guys living there. And he found out where I was. I don't even know how he found out because my parents didn't even know where I lived. Somehow he found out. He knew someone who knew someone who lived. And he calls me. This is, this is before cell phones. So he calls the actual you know number, and I just happen to be there. And he says, hey, you know what? We're playing. I was a huge basketball player. Played in school and stuff. And, and he, he's like, hey, we're playing basketball tonight. A bunch of guys. Would you like to come play? I was like, yeah, that's cool. I, I could play. So I played, and, and I saw all these guys that I'd grown up with and that I'd known from church and how well they were doing. And it was like, oh, it's cool to see you guys, you know, play some ball, you know, hang out and talk. And they said, hey, uh, you know, we're going to do this, you know, periodically if you want to come, you know, play. And I said, well, I might. And I said, but I got this stereo I need to put in my car. And, and I knew how to work with Christians, you know. Whenever they know that someone's not a Christian, they'll do anything, you know, to get them to come around. So I'm like, I got to get this stereo put in, and I do not want to spend, you know, a whole bunch of money to put it in. And there's this guy that's really good at electronics. He'll do it for cheap, thinking he's doing ministry on me. And I'll be like, hey, I'm doing the flip on you. I'm getting the free stuff. So I said, uh, is, is there a time where I can bring my car down to your guy's house and you put this stereo in? He's like, oh, yeah, sure, Tuesday night. I said, okay, Tuesday it is. Well, what I didn't know was Tuesday night was Bible study night. So they had my car, and I was trapped. I was like, oh, you got me. So I'm in this Bible study. I'm thinking, all right, I'll just listen to these guys. Wait till he gets done, and I'm out of here. You know, this is, this is the last thing I want. I've done this thing. I grew up in this stuff. I am not doing this again. And I remember sitting in this circle of all college. You know, they were all 20, 21, 22 year olds. And, and I remember this line started running through my head. You can't run from me. You can't run from me. I, honestly, I, I think I, that Bible study lasted <laughs> a long time. I don't know how long it was, but it seemed like a long time. But I don't remember anything that anyone said in that Bible study. I don't remember what they talked about. I don't remember what they prayed about. But I just remember that line for about two hours going through my head. You can't run from me. You can't run from me. And at the end, they had a prayer, and they had said, hey, why don't everyone get together and hold hands and pray. And they started praying, and I started crying. But I don't know why I'm crying. All right? It's one of those, I felt like, uh, I asked my wife all the time, why are you crying? She's like, I don't know. I'm like, really? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just crying. I, I don't understand it. But I do understand it from this one moment. All right? So I was crying, and I didn't know why. And I just kept crying, but I wasn't saying anything. And everyone was like, what? are you all right? Are you all right? You need to pray. And I'm like, you know, I was crying, but I wasn't making any sound, like noise. So they start, you know, coming around me and wanting to talk and, and all that. And I'm, in my mind, I'm having this conversation with God. And I'm saying, look, I, I know enough about you. I guess this is you speaking to me. I haven't heard this for a while. I haven't felt this for a while, but I guess it's being you. But I can't do that life that I did. I'd rather just die in this life. Because at least I'm doing what I want. That other life, I, I can't do that anymore. But I said, you know what? I know this, lot, this road leads to disaster and death and whatever. So if I'd give you, if I'd give this thing one more shot, God, can it be different somehow? Can this stuff I hear about love and forgiveness and all that stuff, can that be the road that I'm on and not all these. I said, if that's it, I'll try it. But this is it. If this doesn't work, I'm done with you forever. And don't ever bug me again. I mean, I'm saying all this in my mind. I'm not telling anyone else. They have no idea what's going on. Uh, so I got up from there. And I said, okay, thanks, guys. Thanks for praying with me. Uh, I really feel like 
something's changed in my life. And they're like, well, what's that mean? And I didn't use any of the church lingo. <laughs> they're like, what does that mean? I'm like, I don't know. I just know that I can't keep going the way I'm doing it. I can't be with who I used to be. So if there's not a third way, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going to go. And so I began that. And so I moved out of those guys. They said, hey, come come live with us down here. And And so I moved into the house. And what happened was I began to experience a new, a new road. My road trip started a new, a new way. And I've shared with you other parts were, you know, along that way, had some challenges and bumps and all that. But that was, that was when I was almost 20 years old after being gone for almost five and a half, almost six years, you know, getting close. Uh, and I share that story to, with you because all of us have something that separates us from Christ at some point. I don't know what it is that separates you, but I want you to hear Paul's now version of what he shares his story. This is in Acts chapter 6. This is the same story you just heard, but this is Paul sharing it in his words. It says, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You have permission to speak for yourself. So Paul motioned with his hand and began his defense. King Agrippa, I consider myself fortunate to stand before you today as I make my defense against all the accusations of the Jews, especially so because you are well acquainted with all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. The Jewish people all know the way I lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also Jerusalem. They have known me for a long time and can testify, if they are willing, that I conform to the strictest sense of our religion, living as a Pharisee. And from now and now it is because of my hope and what God has promised our ancestors that I am on trial today. This is the promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. King Agrippa, it is because of this hope that these Jews are accusing me. Why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priest, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And they were put to death. I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. I tried to force them to blasphemy. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest. About noon, King Agrippa, as I was on the road, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun blazing around me and my companions. We all fell to the ground. I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, Who are you, Lord? I am, Jesus, whom you're persecuting. Get up, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as servant, and as a witness of what you've seen and will see of me. I will rescue you from them your own people and from the Gentiles, for I am sending you to them, to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan, so they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among them that are sanctified by my faith in me. So then, King Agrippa, I was not a disobedient from the vision of heaven, to the vision from heaven. For to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and even to the Gentiles, I preached that they should repent, turn to God, and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. That is why some Jews seized me in the temple courts and tried to kill me. But God has helped me to this very day. So I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I am saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer as the first rise first to rise from the dead, would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. I'm not insane, most excellent Festus, Paul replied. What I am saying is true and reasonable. The king is familiar with these things, and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none has, has escaped his notice, because it was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, Short term, or, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, except for these chains. I guess that's why I share it today. I don't know what separates you from Christ. I don't know if it's anything like the story of Paul or me, or maybe it's your, a relationship you have 
or your desire to have things or money or success. Or maybe it's just that you don't want to you don't want to give up stuff. You think you got to give it up and think. I'll share with you what I learned that day, August 22nd, 1991. I found a forgiveness and a freedom that I'd never felt and never experienced still to this day. See, it wasn't about the rules and the regulations and all that. It was about finding who God created me to be and enjoying that and enjoying it with those around me. And I found it, and I've connected with so many people over the years. I used to feel like, well, when I was growing up, we only hung out with church people. I don't do that much anymore. I mean, I do hang out with people from church, but but my friends are very much across the board. Well, I, I had to do this, and I had to do that, and I couldn't do this, couldn't do that. I really don't look at life like that anymore. I say, Jesus, you've forgiven me. And I'm trusting you in this path. And I'm clinging to you. Help me to love like you love. Help me to forgive like you forgive. Help me be compassionate and kind like you are. Because this Romans passage, and the last thing we're going to share today, as Lori comes up and close. Nothing, Romans says in 8, nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. Except one thing. You know what that is? You or me. There's no height, no depth, no great tragedy, no sickness, no illness, no nothing that can separate you from God, from Christ Jesus, except you. the last time I get to share with you, so I'm just going to leave you with this. There's nothing greater that I've found in this world than the forgiveness and the love of Christ Jesus. Even if you didn't even want to follow Jesus, all the attributes of him, I've stacked them up and go, that's what I want in a best friend. That's what I want in a spouse, someone who's kind gentle, compassionate, forgiving, loving, patient. And if I expect that from my friends and from my spouse and my kids, then maybe I should be also giving that out. And I realize that I can't do that on my own. I tried. I I fell face down. He is the only reason I can do that. Don't let something else separate you from Christ Jesus today. That's what I want to share with you. Because it's not worth it. Life's short. Enjoy it. Enjoy it with each other. But do it through the life and the eyes of Jesus Christ. I promise you. It's not easy. It's not always the most comfortable. But it's the greatest love and freedom that you'll ever experience in your life. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.